Hello. Um, just wait for two people to say it. Um, just <coughs> so I, I might have to sit down at some point. Uh, if you want to know how to avoid a, this kind of thing, don't crash your motorbike in Indonesia. Great idea. Um, so anyway, I've, I'll try and stand up, but at some point I might have to sit in my wheelchair. Um, I want to talk about uh, how to do things wrong uh, in a sort of best practices sense and still be successful because many people do everything right or follow all the best practices and fail so I thought we'd do it the other way around. Um, who am I actually? My name is Julian Finn. You can follow me on the internet at HDS Julian. I'm some probably is the CTO or COO or something of Matinoa Technologies. We don't really care about titles and uh, so I, I basically run the developer team. Um, and I used to do consulting, um, so when I co-founded Matinoa, I was full of all these great ideas and all these sort of, this toolbox of things I applied with my clients, my customers on how to do things right, you know, like best practices that work for medium size and bigger com companies and startups and how to be all innovative and stuff like that. So talk about Martinoa first. Martinoa was founded in September so 2016. And the reason why we founded it is a very long story. Um, the short version of it is that uh, we were founded after my co-founder and CEO, Emerson, uh, did a long-term re disaster relief uh, project in Sierra Leone during the Ebola crisis, uh, upon which we found out that the developing world uh, urgently needs access to better banking and better payment, uh, online or digital payment solutions. Now, if you're interested, there's this YouTube link. I'll put it up somewhere on the internet to watch. It's a great talk if you want to see, but it's not the topic today. Um, so we build digital payment solutions for really tough environments. Um, and when we set out to do, like to, we founded our company, what we set out to do is basically changing the development aid world. And in the course and after that uh, to bring financial services to one and a half billion people in the world who have no proper access to banks, banking systems, financial services. Um, we wanted to work with NGOs, with governments, with private entities. We had it all figured out. We had a very clear product and a very defined market, and we were ready to go. Our objectives made it a little harder, though, because the first objective was that the system must work during network outages, and that means not only unstable internet environments in the back country of uh, some developing country, but also, for example, disaster prone uh, situations, uh, areas that are struck by a hurricane or by an earthquake. Um, it must also be cheap, which means affordable for people uh, who are very, very poor and have uh, live off less than a dollar a day. Um, it must be highly secure because we're actually handling money. And it must be easy to use, which is probably the toughest one if you're talking about people who have a uh, very, very low uh, uh, level of uh, education, are illiterate, have never seen a smartphone before, etc. So that's what makes it hard. What it actually makes it hard for us is we're handling money. So we have to be, have to be secure. Um, in erratic network conditions, which means they can be intermittently out or not, or working, or we don't really know. Uh, on really old hardware, because you can't just expect for everybody in a certain developing country to own a Samsung Galaxy S9 or something. They're probably going to run on really, really old uh, smartphones. And with tons of mal malware around, uh, which makes the whole thing even more problematic because you can't really trust the app. Um, and with illiterate users. And illiteracy uh, works in very different ways. Um, it's not only technically illiteracy, but also financial illiteracy. So people don't really know how to save up money or uh, how to, to do 
banking things. Uh, it can also be technical illiteracy. People don't know how to use a smartphone or other technology. And uh, also in very socially unstable environments, which is code speak for corruption and theft and uh, violence. So uh, that's what but basically we knew the conditions would be when we started our project. What we built in the end, uh, now after a little more than two years of uh, developing and spending quite a bit of money, is an, app, an Android app as the terminal, uh, a smart card for each user which connects to the Android app via NFC, um, a Merkle tree-like data structure in the back end. Anybody who's a little familiar with uh, blockchain technologies, this is one part of what blockchain technology consi consists of. The other part is uh, arguably bullshit. And the uh, we valid valid we make sure that the transactions we create are cryptographically valid. I'm also I could also give a completely separate talk about this topic, but I'm cramming very many things into one. And if you have any questions, just contact me afterwards because it's going to be a very um, it's going to be a very broad talk. Um, what we basically did is mitigating the risk that would lie on a an usual environment on the smartphone itself towards smart cards, which are very very much harder to uh, to attack to crack. So that's uh, what we what we did in the end. We pulled down the risk from the from the from the big computing layer, which is a smartphone, to a smart card. Now we did all this after you know uh, with uh, with quite some effort and um, after thinking long and hard and did all these kind of things. But we set out and we had all this tool. We, we had this traditional toolkit of things that are what you should do when you do start a company. You know, you should follow best practices, such as being lean. You know, some of you might have read The Lean Startup, great book, uh, as long as it works for you. Uh, you should be agile. A lot of you have read the Agile Manifesto, work in Scrum, you know, do all these kind of things, fantastic, if they work for you. Um, do design research. There's fantastic work to be done if you follow classical design research principles, you know, you do all these kind of things, I'm going to talk about that later, great thing. And follow all sorts of development best practices, um, which are also really good if they actually work for you. Let's start with being lean. Lean startups creates, creates an MVP. You build, you measure, you learn, and you iterate on, on your product. You A-B test to optimize. You work towards product market fit. At some point you reach product market fit or you pivot. And then, well, we actually pivoted ourselves, but the usual way is to get the product out uh, as early as possible and then see where it goes and where it takes you and experiment with users. In practice, this only works if you have a, if, if the technology stack itself exists. So if you have to build really new technology, you can scrap all that until you're actually ready to launch. But even if you're ready to launch, the whole concept of early adoption only works in certain developed markets. If your market is somewhere out in the middle of nowhere in a developing country in Southeast Asia, the whole concept of early adopters and of constant feedback by users and being able to actually contact them and, and, and talk to them is completely bonkers. It doesn't work. Um, releasing prototypes doesn't work if you actually deeply care about security. And I don't mean just like this data breach you might have or something which is bad enough for itself. But if you actually care about security on a deep level and handle cash, you got to you got to go so deep with your technology that it's absolutely rock solid uh, at the time of the release. And then, of course, if you have clients that are technically inadept NGOs and governments, there's also the whole idea of just releasing something into the wild and then testing it out, uh, try good luck convincing them that we're going to work. And then, in the end, part of our technology is basically comparable to space technology in a way that if you shoot a rocket out into space, there's no way of, uh, of updating it anymore, of bug fixing it anymore. And the same sort of rigorous processes we had to apply to uh, our smart car technology, which makes the whole thing with the whole being lean a little difficult. Next one, being agile. Great thing. 
to use the same <coughs> framework like Scrum, and you implement it, <coughs> and you second, you implement it, and you measure it, and you see you do constant uh, feedback rounds with your team and see how the Scrum process is implemented and where you can improve and what you can do, and then um, you release early and you release often and you make sure that. Um, your release cycles are put into sprints and uh, you, know, you iterate on it and all great stuff. You have very defined roles in your team, which is all great as soon as your team has grown to a certain bit. But when you start out, all, the, all of that is a, a little different. It's because everything is great if you have a team. But we had six teams and every team actually consisted of one person. Every single person in our team, in our like company, was a very specialized person that created their own tech stack for a very succinct role. So for example, we had one person building the smart car technology and they were not in any way interacting with the backend or the app developer until a very, very late point. Um, there were APIs defined, yes. There were some sort of interactions there, but mainly everybody was just building their own stuff for over a year. We had, you know, we had the we had meetings and we had talked together and make sure made sure that everybody was going along fine and helped each other out. But if you if you build technology that is so different from each other that you you're not just talking about one vertical stack of like you know, back end and 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 front end and the app and stuff like that, then you and you diverge diverge so far, it doesn't really make much sense to just build a build a, a, a scrum process as you know it. And because these people didn't have to interact for a long time, the whole concept of sprints was pretty much obsolete because people were uh, working in their own uh, speeds as well, and sometimes certain uh, research projects took longer than an, than you could actually fill into a sprint, and you couldn't really break them down either. Um, and then stories are useful if you want to convey certain ideas to the whole team, but if you just want to make I individuals understand what's to do next and they basically write their own stories, the whole concept of like backlog grooming and proper story review and everything is also very much obsolete. So, um, oops. Um, so there's good, really good value in Scrum, but there's also very much about thinking what actually applies to your team without breaking it. Because if we had just implemented a rigorous process, um, we would have run into all these, all this process framework sort of obstacles that are there to help your team, but they, they can also hinder you very much. Next thing is uh, remote work, because we decided to hire the absolute best uh, on this planet, and the absolute best on this planet don't just live in one place. Uh, we decided to go fully remote. And remote work is absolutely fantastic in concept because the idea of remote work is that everybody sits by their favorite beach and all codes with each other and, you know, and they just talk about the great weather all the time. But in, in truth, it can be really, really, really hard, even though it can be super productive. The productiveness comes out of the fact that you don't sit in a 400 people cubicle sort of open plan office thing where everybody uh, distracts each other from it, uh, everybody distracts each other, distracts each other, but it also is very much about the discipline and about being able to think about the fact that there's other people by the time you end your day are just going to wake up in another pl part of the world and you somehow have to hand over certain knowledge and certain uh, certain things. And um, you can't just rely on your tools um, because the idea is, okay, we are remote, so we'll install this tool. We have Slack and we have Jira and we have, I don't know what other tools, you know. And in the end, if the, if the tools aren't used right, then no one has helped with it. And you have to actually mm, constantly sit down and talk about the whole communication thing. Um, time zones absolutely massively suck because you suddenly have meetings at 
nine o'clock in the morning, eight o'clock in the morning, which is midnight for someone else. And if you have one person sitting in uh, Southeast Asia doing work with a client and the other person in Berlin and the third person in Los Angeles, you're going to have really, really weird, weird meeting times. And that means that you really have to make sure that your team gets enough sleep, that um, people don't burn out because they, because they you know, work their usual schedule, but then stay awake all evening uh, just, to, just to do this meeting, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So putting effort into how your team works remotely is absolutely necessary. And it's also a very, very different thing from just having an office or believing that your same processes that work in an office would work in a, in a remote team. So you have to adapt your tools, permanently keep an eye on your communication. For example, this uh, very simple thing that we had is like every stand-up we did, because sometimes people would just sleep through their stand-up because they got to bed at, I don't know, 2 a.m. and then 8 in the morning was just not the right time for them to do a stand-up. Um, we, we had a protocol of each stand-up. So someone wrote a protocol of each stand-up just to make sure that everybody actually had all the info. Um, also, if you have a sort of semi-remote thing, um, and people, if people are interested in this very specific topic, t talk to me later, because if you have one office with like say three or four people and another three or four people doing being satellites around that, you're gonna have hierarchical knowledge that only exists within that office that you somehow have to make sure that gets out, uh, spreads out to the outside world, which is the same team. So we've, we've put some thought into that. If you wanna talk to me about that, just do. The next thing is my favorite pet topic. I'm going to only scratch the thur surface, but neurodiversity is a very big topic in our company because all these sort of management 101, what to do, how to nurture your team and how to work with each other and everything works great. Everybody is the same, but in fact, neurodiversity means that uh, all personal traits of people are just one new diverse aspect of the whole human biome and that means that we have that there's many people out there that have ADHD who are autistic who have depression who have anxiety disorder and a lot of them work in our company and m often with multiple diagnoses and the reason I know this is that we're very 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 open about our neurological differences but what it also means is that we are very very particular about accommodating those neurological differences because if you work with nerds um, there's going to be a lot of autism and there's going to be a lot of ADHD and just cramming everybody into a meeting without asking if the people are actually comfortable at the moment with doing that meeting or would rather chat, for example, and be much more productive with it is a very, very integral point of, um, in, of cornerstone in getting people productive. So that's just basically scratching the surface on how the management 101, uh, the classical management 101 will fail with... Uh, with non-standard nerds, and that's totally okay because you can accommodate it, but it's also you know, another example where best practices are just not applicable. Also, if you want to talk to me about this, just hit me up later. So, next thing is, if you have this startup and you're really moving fast, and God, are you, you know, really killing it, and then you move fast and then you meet the government. Because um, going to market fast is absolutely great, but it doesn't work if you're talking to ethically, ethically ambiguous ministries. And what I'm talking about there is we had this state in Southeast Asia uh, I'm not going to name, but we were talking to the Vice Minister of Finance, and the Vice Minister of Finance was absolutely great, and he loved our idea about putting this payment system into effect to help the, help the poorest of the poor in this country, where there are many of, and he was an old World Bank guy who was absolutely incorruptible, and that's why he got fired. So... Um, after nine months of intensive talks with him and getting it to the actually pr actual prime minister who really liked the idea, this guy was suddenly nowhere to be found and we found out that he had fled the country because his incorruptible, uh, uh, his incorruptible ethics didn't absolutely not work with the res rest of the government that was highly corruptible and then he was gone. And that's how uh, that sales project, which took us about nine months, failed. Um, we still, you know, there's we held open other posi uh, other options uh, and didn't just rely on this one big sales thing. But um, keep in mind that if you're not operating in your standard Western rule of law sort of situation, 
you might just really run against uh, uh, against a, a wall or two. And that also means that your standard sort of sales pitch forecasting sort of matrix where you say, where you can exactly tell how much percent uh, chance you have, to, you have to make a certain deal work is completely bullshit down there. Because every, if, even if every everybody is enthusiastic, in the end they get shot, and then you've got a problem. Um, so the same problem with techni illit technically illiterate NGOs who absolutely love your project until you understand that their database to run all this is 800 columns wide because they don't normalize their data and that would be the first task to actually get this whole thing into their refugee camp where it would perfectly work but you know you would probably need a year's worth of uh, data um, data uh, um, normalization uh, before you can actually start or bank who mo move as fast as glaciers basically uh, because they're banks so next thing now you have a project or you don't but you have an idea where you want to go at least and you want to do some design research now in theory this is really great because you find an office and you invite your target audience and then you do interviews or user testing, whatever you need to do in the design research project uh, process, and you get your, I don't know, 10, 12, 15 people who are all very much in your target audience, and then you do your stuff with them, and then you get valid feedback, and you take it from there and build something great. This is what our design... Okay, can you see this? So keep an eye... I, I hope this works. Keep an eye on the door. This is our design research in East Timor, and I'm going to talk a little more about. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk a little more about East Timor in a minute, but um, so design research and practice means um, not only that we had to go to really back country, like three hours through muddy, uh, muddy roads and through a river and everything with a four-wheel drive to get there in rainy season. <coughs> But the more fundamental problems start when you sit down and want to build this app or this prototype and you ask yourself, what target, target audience and what office? Because the target audience is actually 100% of the people, but you don't know which country. And it makes a huge difference if you're talking about an African country or Southeast Asian country or an Arab country. And you can't just say, oh, we're going to do it for refugees, so let's get some Syrian refugees who just you know, join this country to do an interview because they have a completely different experience than the ones sitting in um, than the ones sitting in a refugee camp in South Turkey, for example. And these people are completely different than the Christians in East Timor or the people who believe in some nature religion in uh, in the Central African Republic. So um, you absolutely don't know how, who to interview and with what questions. So you sort of make up, you know, make up your mind, build a prototype, and then go there later. Now you go down there, and this is um, has happened a little later. And then you find out that the whole concept of market research, as you know it, is um, is not working there because people just don't know what an interview is. And they don't understand the concept of like I ask you something, you give me an honest answer because they're trying to be friendly because you dra you just travel twelve and a half thousand kilometers to get there. So obviously you want to be accommodated nicely accommodated nicely. <coughs> so getting honest answers is a cu cultural privilege. And that one <coughs> sorry. That made it even more difficult. Now where did we actually go? Timor Leste is where the green thing is. Um, it's an it's its own country on the eastern side of Indonesia. It's uh, the second or the third youngest country in the world. It's the first country of the 21st century. It gained independence in 2001 after the in Indonesians attempted genocide on their population. It's very very poor. It's the tenth poorest country in the world, depending on which kind of um, statistics you measure and there's a huge load of development aid going on there's massive malnutrition people have no access to banking or if they do they spend a day like an average teacher spends a day a month walks three hours to the bank gets their uh, stands in line for three hours gets their salary walks three hours back so that's a lot of potential for change right so uh we partnered with an NGO with uh, called world vision who 
we are now in the process of getting 10,000 smart cards down there and trying to sort of launch our first um, first field test. Um, and what we did to get there is uh, I flew down there in January. I also flew down there six weeks ago and then uh, on the way back crashed my motorbike. Um, and we went there in the back country. So this was the outside of this nice GIF I showed you was this office. Um, this is in the middle of nowhere. It's a small uh, small community of people who earn between 50 and $100 a month and live off their own farming. Uh, apart from that, this is the typical market in, uh, in uh, Aleu, which is uh, the district, uh, the second largest district in smallest district in East Timor and this is a typical situation with people queuing in, in line for a couple of hours just to get their salary. <coughs> that is if that works and if the bank actually has a as a proper um, counter because usually people just go to the next ATM and find out that it has no electricity or no internet connection or no, or no telephone connection whatever they need or just is out of money and they walk back. Uh, so we went there and we interviewed these people and found out that they were very keen on using this because of all these sort of situations. And they were basically understanding the concept, but you know, there's all sorts of all sorts of things we could, you know, make better and the whole concept of using the app was sort of understandable but also not. So we worked into that and there's another talk all to be done about the design research we're doing there, but I just want to scratch the surface again. This is a picture from our user testing. So this is the smart card she's using. This is a smartphone the fake uh, salesperson is using. The idea is that you only need a terminal where you are wherever you're in a shop. So not normal users don't need one. They just need the smart card. <coughs> and these are two other people testing their testing the uh, same same um, system. So we now had established how to build our uh, build our design. We are now had to establish how to build our team technology. Next uh, big topic. Usually you create prototypes and this is great. We also created the prototype. You build a quick prototype, you release it early and then you iterate and then you refactor and then you fix bugs, fix bugs and improve things, which is great, except um, it won't work in very s strong security prone environments. And you never know if your tech stack is actually the right one until you sort of figure it out uh, along the way. We decided to go a completely different approach and threw the first one away. So from day one, we decided that we will use certain technologies to build the first prototype as fast as possible and then completely scrap the whole thing because we believe that iteration kills reflection and we wanted a really strong reflection point after the first prototype if this technology would work. And we decided no. Um, also, security is not taken into account enough. I said that already. And the f most important thing, we wanted to learn if our tech, tech stack is right. So we planned to throw the first one away after we did some simulations and after we um, had it got it through one gate with the investors that sort of got us to the next level. Um, <coughs> because, uh, sorry, um, I really need to speed up. Um, we know, so tech stack is right. We used Git as our first prototype because Git is a database that allows signed transactions uh, between users if you use it right. But we also figured out that it doesn't scale. Um, we learned to do better and we had a really true le value in learning fast that our tech stack, for example, Git, is wrong. And a lot of companies just sit there forever, iterate, improve, and so on and so on. And then at some point decide that it all needs a rewrite when the code base is massive and then you've got a problem. So, because I only have another minute in my speech time, and I might—I hope there's a couple of questions. What did we learn all of this? First of all, 
you got this all the, all this uh, stack of best practices, but you need to learn to improvise. And second, you need to learn to be deliberate about your imp improvisation. What I mean with that is there's not not just one size fits all, and by the book will often often fail. And even if this failure is traced like success success in the first place, you will later learn that what you did might have been wrong just even if it felt right. So you need to reflect, you need to try new things and you need to question your dogma. You need to question all the great dogmas you learn from all the great books and and, and, and standards you, you acquire. And then you make need to make sure that the structure supports the team and not the other way around. But at the same time, you, need, you absolutely need to be deliberate about what you do because you're not allowed to confru confuse your improvisation with chaos. You're not allowed to let it all slip and say, ah, say, oh, we're improvising. And well, in fact, you're doing the opposite. You're just not caring enough. You need to spend a lot of time thinking about your processes, thinking about, um, about what you're actually doing. And even if the ca chaos at the moment is not hurting anyone, it might do in the future. So. Even if things work right now, and even if you think there might be improvisation, be very, very clear about if this is actually just letting it slip or not. And plan ahead, but keep in mind that in the f in the long run we're all dead. Which means basically, if you plan ahead too far, you're gonna it, it's you know there's no point in in planning ahead too far. So um, with one minute overdrawn, uh, this is the end, and I would like to invite you for questions now. Um, thanks very much. Uh, yes. 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 Um, so the question was if I, I said iteration includes reflection, and that's a. You're right. It's a s very strong. Uh, it's a very strong statement. The point is that iteration uh, kills reflection in the bigger picture because you lean back and tell yourself that you're already iterating, so everything's going to be fine. While in fact you often have taken big architectural decisions in the past that you re then rarely iterate on or actually reflect in the future and then you end up with a um and then then you end up with a with a with a you know tech stack for example that is that should have been replaced ages ago but it sort of worked for the most of the time and now you've got all this technical debt so yes iteration is great and it's part of reflection in the s in the uh, you know in the in the smaller uh, level, but you know, switching out, I don't know, Ruby on Rails for Go just because you think it's now better, it's a big part and it, it usually doesn't happen in iteration. Yes, yeah, sure. Um, <coughs> continue. Yeah. Mm. How do you know when improvisation starts to become chaos? Um, you so i what i did at all together with my team is um we we were very deliberate about where like even if we didn't have a process or even if we deci decided that we don't need a special sort of definition of a process for a certain part we all agreed upon that this was the case so if you, for example, um, like we had six six individual people doing six different things. Now, um, if you just don't do any project management with your people, then that is chaos. If you decide with each individual person, if they need some sort of project management structure, if they need some sort of sprint or some sort of prioritization or whatever they need, then that is improvisation upon the standard scrum model that you know doesn't doesn't account for these kind of sort of micro teams but it's still it's still not chaos you know and if one person individually says i don't i i have thought about this i don't need this i'm great with uh, basically knowing my priorities and just 
developing on my own for the next six months, then that is deliberate improvisation, not chaos, because you have to you have thought about this. So it's all about thinking about it and making it explicit. Back there, yes. Oh yeah. <sighs> so so this is <laughs> There's so much fun in this answer. Um, so, okay. Usually, in user, user research, one, one method is to ask open-ended questions, right? So, for example, you would ask, um, I would ask you, how do you live? And, or like, wi wha who do you live with? And you would answer, oh, so I have, I have a family, I have two kids, my kid, you know, my my youngest is one, my older one is three years old, I'm married and I have a dog, and you know. And in this case, they were all like, so who do you live with? Oh, my family, okay. Do you have children? Yes, three. Okay, how old are your children? And so on and so on. So you had to pull air everything out of the nose. And the more open-ended you, you would ask the question, the more they would just shut down and um, and not answer your question at all. So. This was very, very difficult. Um, we luckily we figured out that um, the Timorese society is very, very homogenous, which worked in our favor because after about three or four interviews, we already could anticipate the questions depending on their age and their gender. Um, everybody had the same kind of family structure. Everybody had the same kind of job. <coughs> Everybody had the same kind of living conditions. There was not very much variance. Um, so when we did the second round of interviews and user testing, when we, fi when we did some teaching, how it worked, and then you know had users play around with it, we asked again, like, what were your obstacles? How did you, li uh, how do you, how did you feel when, when pr uh, using, using our system, et cetera, et cetera, which gave no response at all? People were like, "Oh, it was great! Thank you for coming so far just to help, uh, just with your new, with your new technology to improve our lives. Thank you very much. Like, great that you're flattered, but that's not the point. Uh, what we then did is move in towards focus groups. Um, focus groups, for those who don't know what it is, it's basically you sit down a group of uh, interviewees and give them a certain topic and just ask them to talk about this topic. For example, how was your experience with your app?" Um, and usually you have some sort of room that is prepared where you can see from the outside and they all sit around a table that all didn't exist there. What we ended up doing after a couple of different attempts is that I put the re voice recording app, uh, st started the voice recording app on my smartphone, put it on the table and just asked them to sit there and talk about their experience and then just took the voice recor recor the, the, the voice recording uh, and, and, and had it write, uh, had, it, had a translator sit down and write down what they, what they talked about. Because any interaction where I was involved in, I was the center of the attention, it didn't work. So, um, Any other questions down there? I so yeah, so I was cutting that one short. So if you have a if you have an office, say you have a team of six people and four of them sit in Hamburg in their office, two of them sit remotely somewhere, you have you're gonna have um, knowledge that only circulates and exists within that office because people go to lunch with each other, etc. Um, what we did, like we were talking about things changed, okay, but we had a con pretty specific plan about creating a Berlin office for three to four people. One idea we had was actually creating the office for a small amount of people and have people circulate around so that everybody was forced to do at least one or two days of home office which you can also do if the people can't work from home because you then just send them to a co-working space. And <coughs> that <coughs> gives everybody the, um, that still gives everybody the idea of working partially remotely and sort of they can then keep in mind more that they are, they're not 
amongst themselves, but there's per people out there. Another one is that um, all discussions, like this is a discipline thing, and I don't know how much it works, but it very much depends on the team. But we had a phase where there was, um, where where people would sit, like every even every, every coffee talk they would have or anything, anything where they talked about work, they would actually write down a protocol afterwards and put it into Slack. So, hi, uh, Dick and I just wrote about, uh, talked about this. Uh, these were the three topics we uh, we discussed. These, uh, this is an idea we had. Thanks, and then just put it somewhere into Slack for everybody else to read. Because it's not if it's not interpersonal, uh, but it, if it's actual like rel has relevance for your team, then you want everybody to know of it, and that's just not happening if not everybody's in the same place. And it's even worse if some people are in the same place and some are not. More question down back there, yes. Ah. How does my company's business model work like? Um couple of different um couple of different options. Um first one is we charge a setup and a licensing fee with our local partners, for example, uh companies that like or NGOs. Those are not too big. <coughs> we then the we then set up a joint venture with um the NGO or the government or whatever on site. If a government decides to not set up a joint venture but run it their own, then the licensing fee is larger. Um if the joint venture is set up, then the whole payment system has some sort of um payment stru or fee structure which we then participate with. Um there's different ideas there which go very deep into the way d the development aid work world works but for example one idea we had explici explicitly for uh, East Timor and that might actually <coughs> be put out set up in this way in the future <coughs> is that you take a fee every time money exits the system so you want to keep the money in a closed loop system as long as possible because every time the money exits the system it runs the runs danger of leaving the country which is uh where like capital flight and, and tax evasion is a big problem down there so you want to keep it in the system which also would benefit the country and if it doesn't we take our cut um yeah basically with it, it's a mixture out of technology licensing um fees and then also financial services on top so if you have a payment system and you have a you have a digital uh, uh you have a you have a um a transaction history of the last six to twelve months you can then work together with microfinance institutions uh microcredit lending companies etc etc um to give out Microcredits to or um, loans to uh, people uh, at a at a better rate than currently possible, and uh, that, for example, is another uh, way of uh, of doing business. So there's it's a it's a multi-tier thing. Um, if you're more interested, we can talk later. If we had a team that worked individually, did we have a 4i principle like pull requests? Yes. Uh, luckily, I like most of the... Yeah, um, yeah. Like, um, depends on which part of the product, but yes, we tried to make sure that most of the components were peer-reviewed by uh, somebody. Um, we also tried to limit the bus factor with uh, exactly the same uh, idea so that we always had a second person sort of being into the technology but not actually uh, actively developing it. But as te part of the technology was super specialized, especially the smart card part, this wasn't always that easy. Would have been better if we had had the double the budget and like work two people everywhere, but that just didn't work out. Any more questions? Great. It's always it's uh 
We're uh, on, on time anyway, so if anybody has a private questions, just come down or I'll come up in a minute, minute and uh, thanks very much.